Hello and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And I know those of you that know me are surprised to hear me talking about hyperhidrosis, of all things. Um, and I'm sure most of you, like me, spend most of your day performing aesthetic procedures for your patients, trying to make them feel better about themselves, improve their appearance in general. And don't really spend a lot of time treating hyperhidrosis unless you're in a dermatology practice. I'm in a plastic surgery practice. So patients don't seek us out for hyperhidrosis traditionally. But I can tell you, I have been treating patients for hyperhidrosis just with the neurotoxins. I have not used the mirror drive. But the patients that have come to me for other aesthetic reasons, and we end up talking about hyperhidrosis, they found out that I can help them with the use of a neurotoxin. These people are thrilled, even more so than the aesthetic patients that I provide treatments for. And they're typically very happy as well. But that there is very few things more devastating that I have heard from patients of conditions that they have than the hyperhidrosis and the way it affects their lives and inhibits their contact with people and uh, interaction with people can just be devastating. So it is very rewarding, you know, when you can help these people. Now, hyperhidrosis, at least 2.8% of the population in America are affected by focal hyperhidrosis. And we'll talk about the difference in focal and generalized in just a minute. It affects men and women equally, and most commonly occurs to people between the ages of 25 to 64. Some of these people actually have had the condition since childhood, and up to 50% there is a familial tendency here. So that implies a genetic component. So the impact that this has on daily life for these people, just picture a sweaty palm and you're trying to shake the hand of somebody you first met. How embarrassing and devastating that can be. And writing. These people come in and talk to me about they're in school and they're trying to take notes. They can't even hold the pencil or the paper is soaked. They have to turn it in a paper and it's soaked. So it really can impact. Think about just waving to somebody, being afraid to do that, you know, being inhibited from just normal activities that we do not give a single thought to. Wearing flip-flops and shoes. How embarrassing it is if somebody calls you out that, you know, what, what is that? So it's hyperhidrosis is much more than just the occasional sweaty palm when you get nervous or that intense sweat that you may do with extreme exercise when the temperatures soar like they can down here and everyone is sweating. It is devastating to these people. And you can see, look at this hand, this girl holding up her hands here. Totally soaked, totally soaked. And look at on your right, the feet. It totally soaks the plastic that this person is standing on and the garment damage that people have. So let's first talk about the anatomy of the sweat glands. There are two types of sweat glands, eccrine and apocrine, and they differ in their structure, their function, the type of sweat they, dis they secrete, and the distribution over the body. They're the same in that they're small tubular structures of the skin that produce sweat and both of them have muscles that contract to make them secrete the sweat. They're both controlled by the autom autonomic nervous system and by circulating hormones. The eccrine glands is the primary form of cooling. That's our body's mechanism for protecting us from overheat. These glands are distributed all over your entire body. This is water-based sweat, and the, the glands are secreted the pores are directly on the skin. So this sweat is just uh, deposited directly onto your skin. These glands are 10 times smaller than the apocrine sweat glands. They don't extend as deeply into the dermis. And as with oil glands, as we age, it decreases in number. So it's harder for an older person to relieve themselves of overheating. The apocrine glands really do not help with cooling. That's not their, their purpose or their, their job. These glands are mostly limited to the axilla, the, the perineum, the eyelids, areola, palms of hands, and soles of feet. 
This is a thicker sweat because it also contains sebum and the pheromones. They're inactive prior to puberty. They're most active during times of stress and sexual excitement. So you can see in this diagram here, you can see that the eccrine glands on your left uh, is deposited directly onto the skin. The apocrine glands, that is connected to the hair follicle. Both of these glands reside in the dermal hypodermal interface in the subdermal fat. So what is hyperhidrosis? It's defined as excess sweating, which can be three to four times the normal amount required for temperature control due to overactivity of the nerves responsible for triggering sweat, gland contraction, and excretion. The focal or primary hyperhidrosis is localized to specific areas, mostly the hands, the feet, the armpits, and the groins, because these have the highest concentration of both types of sweat glands, and they're specifically activated by emotional stress. The generalized or secondary hyperhidrosis affects the entire body and is usually due to an underlying health condition. So what we'll be talking about today is the focal or primary hyperhidrosis. If someone has generalized hyperhidrosis, that needs to be uh, really evaluated and diagnosed for what could be one of these underlying health conditions. A lot of different medications can have that effect. So if someone starts a new medication and they start having severe sweating, that's something that needs to be evaluated by the prescribing physician prior to even thinking about treating the symptoms. So the apocrine gland hyperhidrosis, as I said, it does have an heredity factor. It requires first you eliminate any underlying condition that could eliminate the problem. Emotional sweating occurs independent of ambient temperature. You could be in upstate Michigan in the dead of winter and still have your palms and soles and underarms wet with this type of sweating. It occurs in two to three percent of the American population. The emotional stress specifically activates these glands in the palms of the hands and soles of your feet. That's the only time those two areas sweat is with emotional stress. So the consequences of hyperhidrosis are both physical and social and emotional. People that have the dampness all the time, they're going to be more prone to uh, skin infections such as fungal infections, ringworm, warts, eczema, skin rashes. Any type of inflammation they have can be worsened. Friction blisters on the soles of their feet. They have to buy certain types of socks if they're runners or wear tennis shoes to absorb that, that moisture so they do not get uh, blisters just from the dampness. The clammy handshake, the soap paperwork, the slipping grip, the destroyed clothes, those are all very significant issues to these people. And, and this can be expensive, having to replace nice clothes all the time. Also, you get an unpleasant odor that's uh, associated with this. Now this diagram, I know you can't see it very well, but there is an International Hyperhidrosis Society, and they came up with this logarithm of how to, what is the sequence of treatments that's appropriate? And we'll go over that in a little more detail in this next slide. So first, topical treatments. Over-the-counter antiperspirants. If those don't work, then you go to the prescription strength dry salt, which can be effective for a lot of people, but it's also very irritating. And just about everybody that I've ever treated for hyperhidrosis has gone this route already, and they've given up on that. They either couldn't tolerate the dry saw or it just didn't work for them. So they come in for the botulinum toxin injections. Next is the microwave thermolysis that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. What I'm going to be focusing on, the only two treatments we're going to discuss today, is the botulinum toxin injections and the microwave thermolysis. Next, you can do local sweat gland ablation, and we'll talk about that. It, with surgery, you can only remove the glands in the axilla. You cannot remove the glands in the hands and the palms. And systemic medications and then uh, surgery would be an absolutely the last resort. So the palmo plantar treatment protocols, uh, botulinum toxin into the dermis, the microwave uh, electromagnetic uh, therapy is not appropriate for hands or feet at this time. The ionotro 
uh, phoresis device, the person either places their hands in water or stands in tubs of water that passes ionized tap water through the skin using direct electricity. And then again, it would be a surgical intervention, would be the last resort. Now the electromagnetic therapy is only FDA approved for axillary hyperhidrosis. It got its FDA approval in 2011. And the way it works, it delivers precisely controlled electromagnetic energy to the axilla to eliminate or ruin or destroy the sweat glands. The device is called Mirror Dry. What's amazing about it is that it does not harm the surrounding tissues or burn the skin because of the cooling device on the handpiece. And I know you saw that this morning, so you saw exactly how it works. It has lasting results. The sweat glands are destroyed and they're not regenerated. The patients tracked for 24 months had very stable results. 82% reduction of the sweat with these people. It's immediate results. Right after the treatment, they typically can tell a difference in very minimal downtime. It's an office procedure. It takes anywhere from 50 to 75 minutes, typically. It can be painful or is painful without the lidocaine injections directly to the area. Typically, two treatments separated by three months apart, the patient can get very, uh, very good results. Post-treatment expectations, and these are things that typically you would tell a patient to expect. They're very short limited. They last just a few weeks. Mild soreness in the area, some swelling, some numbness in the area. But as I said, these are not permanent uh, conditions or side effects. The secondary effect, which is a positive, reduced hair and odor. So the axillary pomoplantar surgical interventions, the axillary is the only area where you can totally remove the sweat glands, as I said. That can be done with uh, suction, it can be done with laser or uh, retrodermal curatage. The palmer and the plantar hyperhidrosis, those are serious major surgeries that involves isolating the nerve responsible for causing that area to sweat and then clamping it, cutting it, severing it, somehow interrupting that communication. So the botulinum toxin A injection treatments, all three of the commercially available FDA approved botulinum toxins have been used successfully with clinicians. I've used all three of them in our practice. Ona botulinum toxin or Botox is the only one that's FDA approved for axillary hyperhidrosis. Abo and Eco have both been used successfully, but they're not FDA approved for that. So therefore, on a botulinum or the Botox, the patient can get reimbursement from their insurance company if certain parameters have been met. And I'll talk about that in just a second. With the Inco and the onabotulinum toxin, typically you want to hyper-dilute that so you get more migration. With the uh, ABO, I, I reconstitute that like I do anytime that I'm using the Dysport. You're going to divide each side into equal doses. For the ONA and ECO, it's 100 units total or 50 units per side is typically your initial dose. The ABO, 300 units total or 150 units per side. And the anhydrosis typically results in four to seven months of dryness. Now, the insurance reimbursement for the ONA botulinum, and you must order, you know, the Botox uh, comes as a therapeutic and as a cosmetic. If you're going to try, or the patient's going to try to get reimbursement, you have to have the therapeutic NDC number, not the cosmetic NDC number. So you would have to order that specifically through the therapeutic division of Allergan and tell them that it is for the purpose of injecting hyperhidrosis. They can get, you can get detailed instructions on the website if you have never done any hyperhidrosis treatments with a neurotoxin. You go to the Allergan's website, you go to the section that's for healthcare providers, and then just pull up severe underarm sweating, and it'll walk you totally through how to do the procedure, including even the starch iodine test that we'll talk about in a minute. You can call a hotline at Allergan, and there's a uh, reimbursement hotline where they can uh, walk you through the pre-authorization process, give you the codes that are necessary for reimbursement, etc. 
So the treatment process, the minor starch iodine test, is how you can precisely pinpoint exactly what area is this person so hyperhidrotic? Is it all over the axilla? Is there a particular area? This can be done at the initial treatment or it can be done at follow-up to identify resistant areas. Typically, with the axilla, I don't do the starch iodine test. I'm going to hit the entire hair-bearing area with the neurotoxin. Uh, but I, it is helpful if when they come back at two to three weeks, if they have any little resistant area, then it's helpful because I can tell exactly where it is and then pinpoint uh, that area. And typically, I've never had to do more than uh, 20, 25 units of uh, INCO or onobotulinum toxin at a retreatment to get complete anhydrosis. The marking of the injection area, that's helpful. If you mark each injection site, that way it helps you keep up with where you've been and it makes it faster. You don't have to stop and look and have I done this area, this area. Just march along the pattern that you've made and it makes it a very quick and easy procedure. Pain control measures with the axilla is really not that bad. Most of my patients tolerate it just fine, sometimes with topical, most of the time with just a little ice right before the, the treatment. Palms and soles, that's a different story. Those are very sensitive areas, and uh, we'll talk in a second about uh, the best way to help with those areas as far as comfort. Disinfect the area. I always clean it with soap and water first, and then alcohol is the disinfectant. These are dermal injections. You do not want to get into a muscle in any of these areas. So don't go with your needle deeper than two millimeters deep and at a 45 degree angle with the, with the bevel up. So the starch iodine test, you have to tell the patients that they cannot wear antiperspirant for 24 hours prior to the procedure, which is going to stress them out even further because they're dependent on that antiperspirant but you don't want anything interfering with the sweat that you're going to see that day with the starch iodine test. No sweat producing exercise for 30 minutes. I put them in the room, cover them up, have them warm, and come back in 30 minutes after they're relaxed, then do the starch iodine test and I can see what really is excess sweating. Dry the area completely, then paint on the iodine solution, let it dry, and then sprinkle on the it's the starch, the corn starch, fan away any excess. Then wherever there's sweat, wherever that gets wet, the, re in the reaction between the iodine and the starch is going to turn blue-black. The rest of it, if there's no sweat activity, it just stays white. Or the corn starch will cover up the, the darkness of the iodine. Circle the hyperhidrotic area then uh, with a marker, wash off the iodine and the starch, and then do your markings. The injections typically are one and a half to two centimeters apart and staggered. That way you make sure you're getting full coverage of the affected area. So here is pictures of the minor starch iodine test results. You can see on the left this girl's hands totally saturated. I mean, it, you're basically going to treat every area of her hand. Now below is a picture a few weeks after the injections. You can see that how successful it was. And this is what it looks like over on your right when you do see that starch turning dark, that that is a positive result. So these are the typical pre-injection markings for the feet, for the palms, and for the axilla. And typically it's 50 to 80 injection sites. It depends on the size of the foot, the size of the area that you're treating. Just remember to separate them by one and a half to two centimeters. And an important thing to note here too, when you're injecting the hand, always remember not just the palm. Think about the side of the hand. That's the part that lays on the paper when you're writing. Think about in between the fingers when you're shaking hands. With the feet, also I've had a few patients and I haven't done that many feet injections, but I have had one or two that had sweat on the surface of the toes as well, not just the, the pads of the toes and the sole. So I would do one or two little injections on the surface of each toe. 
So the pain control measures, as I said, the axillary region is really not a painful area for most patients. There can be some anxiety associated with it. In those patients, I'll do a topical anesthetic prior to doing the starch iodine test. And ice works beautifully. Also, you want to change out your needles frequently. I go through a lot of these 30 gauge to half inch needles when I'm doing this because the sharper the needle, the less it hurts. The Palmer implantar, that is, it, it is torture without some kind of numbing. I've had a physician that did a nerve block for me one time. It was a, a, a lot of effort. It didn't work that well. It would, that was painful to the patient. So now the topicals really don't work because they don't penetrate through that thick skin as well. So either ice water soaks, just soak the hand until it's so cold the patient can barely tolerate it, then inject. You'll have to repeat those soaks as you go along. But what is beautiful, if you're in a practice that has one of the Zimmer cold air coolers, I have the patient hold the cooler with the hand I'm not injecting and cool as I go along. So they're just following with me with that Zimmer cooler and it works great. Same thing for the feet. So safety considerations for the neurotoxin injections. In the rare, remote chance you could get an infection, you still need to disinfect the area pre and post treatment. Do not cross the bend of the wrist with the Palmar injections because then you could get into affecting some use of the hand and do not inject into the muscles. So potential complications, weakness of muscles of the injection site. It's rare. If it does occur, it's typically due to the Palmer injections. Urticaria, bruising and tenderness, that's more than likely just related to the injection process in the needle. So in summary, the hyperhidrosis can have devastating social, physical, financial, and emotional impact to these patients. Successful treatment leads to dramatic improvement in quality of life for these patients, and the botulinum toxin A or electromagnetic therapy treatments are uncomplicated for properly trained practitioners and provide minimal to no recovery for these patients. Treatment should be appropriate to that area being treated and best meet the needs of your patients. So at consult, find out what is important to them. Is the cost a factor, the longevity of the results? Help them decide if you have access to electromagnetic therapy and the neurotoxins. That would be a discussion to have. We don't have the electromagnetic device in our office yet, so there's a lot of my patients that they're like, I don't know if I want to do this twice a year, or even at the best once a year. I'll tell them about the mirror dry, the dermatologist that is close by that has it. I've had several patients that have gone over there. They have had phenomenal results. They still come back to me for the rest of their procedures, and they're extremely happy. That is a one-time procedure. So here you go. Hands up. Thank you. Thank you.